It was Christmas Eve, and I was at work, and okay with it. I'd been a nurse for 15 months and only working at UCSF in the pediatric ICU since October. Long enough to be off orientation, but not long enough to have Christmas off. I'd grown up with parents who were a midwife and an obstetrician in a joint private practice. They were never home at predictable hours. My mom loved saying, babies don't make appointments, as she rushed out on yet another holiday or one of her kids' birthdays. Usually, one parent stayed at home. But if something bad happened, both my mom and my dad headed to the hospital. So in our family, holidays happened on random Tuesdays, sometimes weeks after the actual event. Having grown up on, like this, working on Christmas Eve was just fine with me. I was off Christmas night, so after my shift at 7, I was planning to drive home to my parents two hours away. Then my family would actually attempt to celebrate Christmas on Christmas. The pediatric ICU at UCSF is an amazing place. The end of the end of the line. When children's hospitals all over the West Coast couldn't fix a kid, couldn't diagnose a kid, they sent that kid to UCSF. There, that kid, regardless of insurance, received the best, latest, and most innovative care. But we were the end of the end of the line. And that means a lot of those kids died. I was trained as a nurse, so of course, intellectually, I understood the kids died. Cancer, congenital heart disease, car accidents, drownings, and asthma, all these things killed kids. But until I walked into that, I'd never really given it much thought. It's hard to wrap your head around, and it happens almost every day at UCSF. The hospital at Christmas Eve was festive. The nurses had planned a late night potluck and would celebrate together overnight. Business was relatively slow because heart surgeons and pediatric oncologists want holidays off. So unless it is an emergency, like an emergency emergency, no surgeries are scheduled the week before Christmas. And if you were born with a bad heart that week, well, if you were stable, as in not dying right now, you could wait for surgery too. The doctors did this only partially to protect the families to avoid the families associating holidays with their bad times in the pediatric ICU. In nursing school, we're taught about professional boundaries between patients and families and how it wasn't right to get over-involved and it wasn't right to get too close. Violating professional boundaries was thought to erode the patient-nurse relationship. The nurses in the PICU thought this was bullshit. <laughs> they knew that when you were taking care of someone's baby, someone's infant who was critically ill, you were getting involved. They didn't worry about boundary rules, and I easily adapted. I was assigned a stable baby girl, Anissa. She had a heart defect that had just been corrected and was in recovery. Anissa was still on a ventilator, but doing well. And in the morning, on Christmas, we were going to remove her ventilator, and her parents would be able to hold their baby girl and see her face without a tube for the first time. The ICU was all glass walls where curtains were left open between the beds most of the time. Usually, we were only assigned to one patient, and never more than two. My patient, Anissa, was among the most stable, although still considered critical. The baby in the next room, Ethan, was fresh from surgery with his chest still open. His heart was swelling from all the tiny sutures holding his new anatomy together, and a see-through dressing was applied to his chest, his sternum left splayed open. Tonight would be touch and go. The nurse, the surgeons, and the pediatric ICU intensivist would hover, waiting, hoping Ethan would make it through the night. I went about my work and settled into caring for Anissa. At about 9 p.m. every night, the nurses tried to create some quietness to simulate nighttime on the unit. We'd even dim the lights in the kids' rooms and the hallways, but there was always noise. The constant beeping of the monitors tracking heart rates and oxygen saturation, the pumps running fluids and medications into tiny veins, the residents at the desk dictating notes and the nurses gossiping while lives hung in balance. I was pretty sure. By looking at Anissa's vital signs from the nurse's station, I was pretty sure she was sleeping in her morphine haze. The night wore on and most of the families left to sleep. We had no visiting hours or restrictions on who visited. The parents could stay all day and all night. Ethan's parents stayed in chairs at the edges of the room. The new mother cried occasionally next to her shell-shocked husband. I did my best to help Ethan's nurse with all the things he needed just to keep him alive. 
I still had a lot to learn, and being in a room with the sickest kids was a good experience for me. We left the cur curtains open so I could watch Anissa. Every hour, I'd check all her vital signs, suction her breathing tube, draw some blood, and rub her head or pat her diaper. Next door, the nurse stayed hutched over Ethan's warmer. The parents huddled together in a corner. Occasionally, we'd leave our patients' rooms to sit outside, eat, and talk about our holiday plans. Sometime after midnight, the alarms in Ethan's rooms went off all at once. The nurse yelled for backup. Someone ran to wake the resident and the surgeon. Ethan was coding. In a code situation in an ICU, we are the code team. I, because I was new there, was the recorder. I wrote the stories. Orders were given calmly because when you code a kid like every day, you get good at it. Push meds, remove the dressing from the open chest, crack the chest, hold the heart in your hand and pump it quickly and gently. Hope the medication will work. Hope to save someone's dreams. The parents were always offered the choice to stay during a code. Most often they would hover at the edge next to the recorder, me. Ethan's parents chose to stay, practically cuddling me. The code went on for 20 minutes. It felt like four hours. I scribbled furiously. The baby's heart was held and massaged. The medications were pushed. Should we call it? The pediatric ICU team would ask and the surgeons would refuse. Ethan's parents stare, we stay focused. And then the mother spoke, not particularly loudly. She was no longer crying. But it's Christmas. How can this happen on Christmas? She is looking at me. I'm 23 years old and I can't figure out how to stop breaking up with all my boyfriends, much less why our kid is dying. I can't wrap my head around it any better than she. Ethan's mom grabs my arm. This is not my baby, I tell myself. This is not my family. Maybe the boundaries aren't bullshit. We call the code. The parents are whisked away to the grief room to sit with the nurse until the room can be cleaned, the baby prepped. They are offered a chance to hold their now dead baby. I check my very alive little Anissa and give her some morphine she probably doesn't need because shit, the baby next door to her just died. Someone around here might as well be high. <laughs> I return to Ethan's room. The energy is different, there is less, not only in the less energy of the lack of commotion in adults, but there is a baby missing. I was taught by a Native American nurse to open a window to let the spirit escape, and I could feel when it had. With kids, you really had to pay attention, but you could feel it too. In the ICU, we had no windows that opened, but down the hall in the elevator shaft, there were a few, and someone went to open one. Tonight, I paid attention. We cleaned the room and bathed the baby while the surgeon sewed Ethan's chest closed. We kept a few outfits around for just these moments and put baby Ethan in clothes for the first time in his life. His color wasn't good, but he wasn't cold yet. It was time to get his parents. I followed his nurse. She said, I needed to learn this. We handed the baby to his sobbing mother. She looks up at us with searching eyes. This is her Christmas memory. The one memory to replace all of her Christmas memories. This becomes my Christmas reality. I stroke the baby's head. I tell them I am very sorry, and we leave. I check on Anissa. She is doing fine, overbreathing her ventilator, ready for it to go. I eat junk food. One hallway over, her parents cry over their dead baby and build their new Christmas memories. The room next door is cleaned and prepped for the next baby to come through. The sun rises. The city is quiet. I walk out into the crisp morning hour, welcoming the feeling of cold, and drove home crying, knowing that in two days I'd be back, and in two days another kid will die. But I realized it was sadder that day than other days when babies die, because even for me, even with my family history and lack of holiday spirit, Christmas is different. If babies are gonna die and destroy parents and families forever, shouldn't death take a holiday? Yet I know that I'd sleep just fine in my childhood bed when I got home. Maybe my parents won't even be home. Maybe they'll be off bringing a healthy life into the world on Christmas to create someone else's holiday memory. 
and I know that in six hours I'd have a drink silently so as not to ruin everyone else's Christmas to the baby that briefly was and then almost as quickly wasn't. Thank you. That's Lisa Sacco.